welcome to another of my conversations. My name is John Cornicello, and I am here on usually Mondays and Thursdays at 10 Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, today, my guest is Bambi Cantrell. Uh, Bambi's a wonderful portrait photographer and Nikon ambassador, and no, I'm not really her uncle. <laughs> uh, so let me introduce you all to my friend Bambi Cantrell. Hi, folks. It's so nice to to see some of you all out there and I'm really delighted to be here. And thank you, John, so much sure. for allowing me to be here. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about lighting and posing for a modern world. And, but especially in keeping with what's been going on, uh, especially in the photo community, I don't know about the rest of you folks, but um, I'm sure if it's been a challenge for me, it's been a challenge for all of us to be able to know what's coming next and how are we going to be able to continue in our career as photographers um, with all of the the challenges the economic challenges and so forth so i wanted to share with you just some concepts that i hope that um, whatever thing you're doing in the photography community or in the photo space that it'll give you some tips for uh, creating such a unique brand about yourself um, that when it comes to clients that you'll be able to create something that that in spite of the economic times and such that people will just absolutely come to you so i thought i'd start by sharing you just a couple of things about my studio um, this is my studio space uh, it's in a historic building in benicia california um, it's very rugged um, we don't have heating or air conditioning in the building um, so in the summertime it can be a little bit warm and in the winter time can be a little bit cold, <laughs> but the benefits outweigh the negatives. Um, by and large, I generally use um, uh, window light for my, most of my sessions, um, just because our windows, we have you know 40 foot ceilings and, and it's very, very tall ceilings. And so we have lots of natural light that comes in the space and it makes it very, um, very inviting for folks. This is my area where we usually uh, sit with clients and do our sales presentations. As you can see, we have a large monitor. And then we have large prints on the wall. Um, and that way they kind of, we can point to something and say, hey, here's a 30 by 40, or here's a, here's a triptych, or you know, here's a, a box that holds matted prints and things of that nature. We use um, Album Epica as our album company and absolutely love them. Our customer service is beyond compare. And I really feel that way. Um, they're not paying me to say that. It just is really honestly the way I feel. Um, this is one of our shooting areas in the studio. It's basically just opposite that space that you just saw. And what I like about it, um, we use very comfortable environments for our photo sessions. We really like having like big comfortable couches. And this particular couch, we used it for... Um, um, we'll have kids jumping on the couch and, you know, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things. I like to do portrait sessions where people are lounging or comfortable. Um, I think that really makes a huge, goes a long way in having people feel like the experience is um, a very relaxed experience. Um, and we painted the walls this kind of a neutral shade of gray. Um, and the reason for that is that we just wanted it to keep it just very modern um, and something that is not too busy. I, I don't use a ton of backgrounds. However, I do have some backgrounds in my studio um, for those occasions when I just feel like, you know, I feel like a nut and sometimes I don't. I think you understand what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just feel like doing something a little bit different. Um, this is like one of my very favorite spaces. And, and the reason I bring you this slide is I like people to notice and think about that you don't need lots of toys to create a beautiful portrait. That really all you need is a window on a wall and maybe a reflector. Um, my favorite reflector these days is the sun bounce reflector and it's about the same size as this one, um, but it's on a rigid background and I really, really like it very, very much. Is that um, the California sun bounce? Yeah, the California yeah. sun bounce reflector. I really, that is my very favorite. I have two of them. One's about uh, four by six and the other one is a smaller one than that, maybe three by five. Do you have a um, preferred fabric on it? The zebra or the plain white or silver? Um, good question, John. <laughs> I prefer, I like the silver and the white. 
is my, but it's just kind of a soft white. It's not a real super shiny white, but it's not the zebra one. Um, you know, and I, I really like, um, in fact, I really like one of the things I like about that product is that you can get a couple of different, um, um, you know, different kinds of fabrics. You can get the black, which is a subtractive, um, and there's several different things that you can do on those. And I really like that. Um, in this, you'll also notice that I have a really um, high tech <laughs> softener in the window. It's nothing more than a piece of opaque plexiglass that's in the window. Um, just plastic I bought at Tap Plastics. And it has a piece of Velcro on the end of it. And um, so that I can, let's see if I can, oops, hang on here. Um, Let's see, does that let me go back here? No. Um, um, at the very top, I have Velcro strips across the window so that it'll, I can just pop it up in the window very easily and then it comes down very easily as well. Um, this is a, um, a um, east facing window, so it gets bright sun in there in the morning. So having that piece of plexiglass in the morning is really good. It's a great way to just soften that light up. Super, super easy to, to deal with and then I can just move on. So let's talk about getting to know you. Well, what are some of the things that we can do to get to know our client and also to get to know and to change, not change, but to adapt who we are today for who, what we need to, to be tomorrow? Well, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, these are some Vogue magazines. I, I went to an exhibit in um, Paris a couple of years ago, and it was a, an exhibit by a designer, um, Christian Dior. And I thought this would be such a wonderful educational tool. What I want you to notice are the variety of different kinds of images that, and the styles of clothing that have, have um, happened over the years um, that uh, Christian Dewar has been around. I mean, some years the styles were very opulent, some years they were very clean and sleek and such. And so I started thinking, well, how does that translate to what I do as a photographer? Well, basically what that means for me is that who I am today and the style of photography that I do today is not going to be who I am tomorrow. Um, do I uh, change who I am? No, but I believe it's important to be adaptable. In other words, to grow as a photographer. To give an example about that, when I started in photography, I've been photographing in the San Francisco Bay Area for about the last 30 years. And when I started in photography in the early 80s, I remember my, one of my first things I ever bought was a set of filters by, um, 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 by some photographer who had all these really cool little filters that you would drop down in the front of your camera, in front of the lens of your camera. Some of them had smoky filters and some of them allowed you to do really cool double exposures. That sounds like the Koken filters. Yeah. Oh, these weren't Koken though. These were but, by some other, some guy who had okay. his own little brand. Okay. And, and the funny thing was, was that, you know, when I got married, I got married in 1975. In fact, yesterday was my husband and I's 45th wedding anniversary. Oh, congrats. Thank you. And so I was thinking about what was really popular when I got started in the realm of photography. Well, when I got married, I wanted that double exposure in the worst way. I wanted that picture of the bride and groom in the wine glass and the bride and groom gazing down on the ceremony like two angels, right? I mean, for those that are maybe um, in their late fifties or so, you would probably have been there with me. So, but what would happen today if you would do that? oh, wait a minute, we are doing that these days. Nowadays, people are, but if you had done that in the 90s or in the early 2000s, nobody would hire you because it was so, you know, it's like, oh, we already did that in the, the 70s and we didn't want to do it again. So I believe that, that style changes and that photography um, is not a static, thing but that it has a heartbeat and that that the, the longer that you're a photographer the more that your style and such can adapt to the changing times and so let me give you some examples I love 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 this picture um, this is a, a Christian Dior gown can you imagine see the side that of that girl's waist and one of the things about this image was today it's very timeless it's very classic and elegant and um, notice what happens though, what they did in this um, gallery. 
kind of reminds you a little bit of that double exposure of the 70s, doesn't it? So here's the deal. As style changes, photography changes along with it. And it, like there are some times when you're going to have more of a minimalist look. Um, look at the, the minimalism in the way that these dresses um, are displayed. Well, what does that mean to you and I as photographers? Look at the way that they are very clean and simple. The backgrounds are very clean and simple. Um, this could be a page in a wedding album. So there's lots of different ways that you can translate what you see visually um, in an art gallery or in a museum um, or going to a fashion show and seeing the kind of styles. And the way the different styles that become more in vogue um, really dictate to me how far I push the envelope. Sometimes like, um, you know, in the, the 90s, the late 90s when I started in photography, it was really interesting, or not when I started, but when I continued my career in the, in the early 90s, I noticed from the time that I started in 19, in the early 80s to the early 90s, style changed tremendously. It went from being extremely opulent to being completely minimalism. In fact, in the early 90s, photojournalism became the rage. And if you did, you know, if you talked about, you know, portrait backgrounds and you, you know, and, and for a wedding, uh, you know, doing things that were more staged or posed, you became pretty much a leper. So now if you contrast that last image to this image, what does this dictate? This dictates, um, there's color, there's maybe, this is more tribal. So you can start seeing how that fashion is changing. Um, color becomes more popular. Uh, and in fact, if you look in the last 10 years, um, more, um, there became, uh, the trends became more digital artists. There were lots of digital artists that came on the scene and the styles of photography became more, um, um, more, um, just different, more bright and bold. In the 80s, who remembers the 80s when in the 1980s, everything had shoulder pads and Dynasty was in. So these are, this gives you kind of an idea of where style goes to. Uh, in the background, you see a picture of the designer for, um, for Christian Dior at that time. And so I, when I look at fashion, I try to see long range trends, not fads. Long range trends tell me a variety of things. They tell me, well, um, is the style that is gonna be um, something that, that is really popular and that is gonna be something that you become a trendsetter in, is it more opulent or is it more subtle? Um, uh, the style, is it more flashy and more animated or is it more uh, lifestyle oriented when it comes to doing portraits and things of that nature? Um, with this, I, this particular image I put in here because I wanted to show you how important lighting is and the color tones that are involved when you're capturing images. Look at this beautiful harmony. The color of the dresses actually are white, but they show up this, this kind of warm lemony yellow, and that's a wonderful contrast to what's going on in the background. So how does that translate to you and I? Maybe it, for you and I, it translates into the, the way that we photograph, the color. Maybe we'll, we, we might start using gels on the background or um, maybe do something that's more uh, silhouette-like um, to an image. Um, in this particular image, there's a number of things I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see structure. Notice how this, this outfit is very structured, close to the body. Um, it showcases the waistline. And then um, um, the way that it is positioned. So how can we use that when it comes to what we're showing to clients? Well, how about, notice how that there's one really long piece, uh, one large window over on the left-hand side, and then smaller images on the right-hand side. Maybe this means, this is, these are concepts that you put into place when you are uh, photographing in your studio. Maybe these are, you don't showcase every single picture you've ever taken. Maybe you sh showcase by showing simple, elegant, one large image, and then a couple of images that are smaller. And then what about this? 
I love this image. I, I love this particular page. This is again from that Christian Dior exhibit. And what I wanted you to see was that there are some images and some things that transcend the decades. A black frame with a large white mat, um, clean black and white imagery. And I will tell you, these are some things that absolutely never go out of style. Um, and you may want to have a wall dedicated to something like this. Um, I really like black mats with a white, an oversized, um, a, a black frame, a simple black frame with an oversized white mat and maybe a smaller image. In fact, when we, in our studio, when we sell an eight by 10 print or a five by seven, or even a four by six print, it always comes on an eight ply mat. Why? Well, because I charge a significant amount of money for that small image. So whether it's a four by six or an eight by 10, it takes me the exact same amount of time to create that picture. And so I want to validate the price that somebody is paying for that image. And this is an area that I really believe that if you incorporate some things like this in what you're doing next, as we come out of this lockdown that we've been in the last three months, um, create a couple of things that are just beautiful and elegant and simple that it's going to be something that can easily set you apart. Um, especially in this world where everybody wants to do, um, to give just the files away. I really believe with all my heart that the printed image is the most important thing that we can create for future generations or the printed image. So in my home, I have lots and lots of images and there I print a lot of my family. I have walls that are dedicated to my, uh, my granddaughters. I'm actually right now in the process of working on my second wall for my new granddaughter. Um, and I will, and they're all black frames with a, an oversized mat there. I prefer the 12 by 12 opening. And then I, I will put a single five by seven, um, opening in that mat. And the reason I like the 12 by 12 size is that I can make it vertical or horizontal. So, and I don't like waste. I really, I, it drives me crazy to, to have a waste, to have wasteful things. So I really find that the 12 by 12 is a really great size for me. Um, I can, um, depending on the image, I can make it vertical or horizontal and still use them. Um, I use ready mat, R E D I M A T for my matting and my, um, my, frames as well. They're super elegant. They're all acid free. And again, they're eight ply mats. So they're really a nice mat to work with. This could be in anybody's home right now. So what does this slide show me? Well, um, this helps me to see style. Um, also colors that are going to be more in vogue. Um, so maybe that will translate into um, the kinds of um, uh, props that you have in your studio. Maybe it translates into um, the kind of things so you can be prepared for when clients come into your studio. Maybe they'll want something a little bit more elaborate when it comes to um, the kinds of props that you have in your space. It also tells me a lot about, if you look at the, the shapes of these garments on the models, it tells me a lot about what is going to be um, in vogue from a wedding gown standpoint. It's really huge. You'd be surprised at what you can learn by going into a, a salon like this. Um, this is a, a picture that I pulled from that same Christian Dior exhibit. And in that exhibit, they had a guy from Christian Dior that was hand making their purses, their handbags. Well, now why is that in here? Well, it's in here because just like someone who hand makes a, um, a handbag that's very expensive, we want to find a way to make our products look very special and very unique. And if they look very special and very uh, unique, then it's going to be something that validates somebody spending a bit more money for our product than other people's products. And if you think about it, um, it's really important because um, in, in the world today, the buyers of photography are mostly women. 
I'd say about 90% of the buyers of photography are women. We're the keepers of history. And so if you can give a woman something that's more tactile, help her to appreciate that it's got lasting value, the archivalness of it, the specialness of it, then they're going to want to purchase that. And also, we don't always purchase the least expensive thing. Sometimes there are, there are, are experiences or, or situations in our life that happen when you want and you expect to spend more money. Maybe it's the birth of a first child. Maybe it is um, a wedding when, you know, when a, a, a man will buy his wife or his girlfriend an engagement present, you know, an engagement ring or something. It's like there are times in our lives when we give ourselves permission. Well, we need to find a way to validate our products so much so that it gives people permission and they're gonna to want to spend more money in spite of what we, we charge, not because we're giving them a bunch of little digital files and they're gonna put them in a drawer and lose them on their hard drive. I, I really feel so strongly about, about the importance of printing our images, which also means that when it comes to printing, um, I use a quality lab. I use Bay Photo Color Lab here in California. And I like printing on a variety of papers. I don't just print on photographic paper. We use um, the cold press bright white and the cold press natural paper. I really like the way especially black and white images show up in that. And my goal is to create something that looks a bit fine art-esque, but with a twist. So if you look at this image, this is again from that Christian Dior exhibit. Do you see how there's an homage to the art of the past, the art of the past, the, the fashion of the past, but it's been twisted in such a way that it becomes modern. And that's really what my goal is, is to create something that looks, that is a twist from the past, but has a bit of modern take, take to it. You know, we've been talking a lot about, um, about the importance of um, separating yourself from the realm of mediocrity. And I don't think there's anybody in the world that does it better than Christian, uh, or excuse me, than uh, Louis Vuitton. Now, if you look at this, this is a store window from Louis Vuitton. You can practically not see the handbag on the left, and the little red handbag is strategically placed. Now, think about it. These individuals, the, the marketing department of Louis Vuitton, spends billions of dollars trying to attract the clients that I want. No, they're not just, they're not rich people. That just because somebody is rich doesn't mean that they spend lots of money on a handbag. People who really value something spend money on it. So sometimes for a girl's birthday or for, for Christmas, that husband might say, or that boyfriend said, you know, I really want to get her something special. Well, that's where, at, where we come in. I really believe that this is nothing more than the purse. The, these are handbags, but they're not selling purses. They're selling an experience. The same is true with Prada. Now, what does Prada sell? Well, among the many things that they sell, they sell shoes. But you know, in this store window, you can barely see the shoes in the store window, can't you? I mean, you have to really look hard. So here's what I learned from this picture. I, I just absolutely was captivated by it. I love the way that they've taken something as simple as a pair of shoes and they've made it into an art piece. So you see, they're not selling a product, they are selling an experience. So now how can I translate that into what I do as a photographer? We've gone through a number of slides now that showed um, you know, different products and so forth, but how, how can we translate into that into what we do? Well, here's one of the ways that I've used that concept. So when it comes to somebody into my, comes into my studio, for those of you that do high school senior photography, are you looking for a, a way to create a unique experience well, that's what I try to do with my high school seniors and those that come in wanting a special portrait. My goal is to create some things. Yes, I'm gonna do the normal, you know, um, the normal pretty things you might want to do for a high school senior. But I also wanna do some things that are different, that are like, what? It doesn't matter to me whether they love it or hate it, as long as they have an opinion about it. I can't tell you how many times in my experience as a photographer, that I've had people come to me and say, oh, well, how did you hear about me? Well, so-and-so, you know, you did that really funky paper dress thing that she, you know, and she had, and I just love that. And then when it comes time for them, they won't want that, but they, but the idea of the something unique is what brought them into my studio space. 
Um, with this particular dress, literally, it's just nothing more than um, newspaper taped on her body. There's a slip underneath for modesty. I start from the bottom of where about the knees are and then work my way back up the body so that it is easy to maneuver. Um, as far as a, the lighting goes, I have a soft box outside of those windows. It's, um, a, it's the, one of the B10 um, strobes from Protophoto with a soft box on it. Simple, simple lighting. I have a, a reflector on the left-hand side and you can see there's that little bit of a kicker light on her elbow, on that left uh, or right elbow. Um, and that's just from a reflector. So that's bouncing the light back into her. There are some times though, when you don't want every image in a grouping to be all perfectly focused, perfectly um, literal imagery. And so sometimes I like to take my, my um, uh, when I'm capturing, capturing images of someone, I like to be a bit more interpretive. And if I'm gonna be interpretive, I'm gonna do it in camera. I just like to do that. It's just my personal preference. Um, it's only one click of the camera, so it's not like I'm going to die. And if they don't like it, then guess what? I, you know, they don't have to buy that image. But uh, my goal is to sometimes slow that shutter speed down significantly, um, create a little bit of, of movement. Um, yes, you can do this in Photoshop, but I kind of prefer doing it just the way I mentioned. And I want them to go, hmm, what is that? Um, my goal is to create something that looks a little bit like something they may have seen in a fashion magazine. These subliminal messages are a great way to validate your, uh, your artistic ability as a photographer and that you do something different. The worst thing that can happen to me is not that someone hates a picture. The worst thing that can happen is that they don't have an opinion about a picture. If it's just they leave my student and go, meh, it was okay, it was, it was nice, it was fine. Those are probably the worst words that I personally can hear. So also when it comes to photographing people, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pigeonhole people into a specific style, nor am I going to pigeonhole them into pose number one, pose number two, pose number three. Sometimes I do my sessions in their home. Sometimes they're done in my studio. Um, I really like it to be a relaxed experience. And you've probably heard me say a number of times the word experience. The experience is way more important to me than the actual clicking of the shutter. If they enjoy the experience, they'll love my pictures. Because I know the difference between an F-stop and a bus stop. So I know how to capture you know, an image that is going to be exposed properly. But the difference between images that are exposed properly and are interesting to exposed images that are, are um, unique or fun or, hey, you caught my smile, are going to be those that are done by, um, you know, really paying attention to the client. So if you look at this couple, look at their body language. Look at the, this is, was taken in their home. And um, I want you to notice a couple of things about it. Look at the way that they're dressed, just a, nice and casually, no shoes, just super simple, not a lot of flashy things. Look at the bed linens on her bed, kind of that, um, I want to say anthropology-esque. And so I pay really close attention to what people are wearing because that tells me absolutely, hands down, how to photograph them. It tells me who they are because we don't necessarily know who we are inside, but we know what we like. And I know what I like. And if I see somebody who's dressed in a certain way, I know what they like because I've really paid attention to fashion and what, what, they're, what they're wearing and what that says about them as an individual. In my interview with clients, I also find out about their family. I like to find out about um, what makes them tick? What are things that are important to them? So when this young couple came to me, uh, I've been photographing this these two kids since they were both about 16 years old. I did their high school senior portraits. Um, I shot their, um, their when they got engaged. And so I've, I've seen them literally grow up. Well, the little teddy bear in the background is really important in this scene. Um, I didn't want it to be the main subject because the new baby was the subject, but I wanted it to be featured in the background because that was the, the last gift that the mother of this, of this young lady gave to her before she died of cancer. Literally, the mom in this picture told her mom she was pregnant 
And then the mother died within about a week um, of, of that. So the last gift that was given was this beautiful little teddy bear. So I wanted to find a way to incorporate that um, in this session. It was done in the client's home. So one of the things that I try to do is I go into the home and I start looking for an environment to work in. I want to find a place where the lighting will give me my biggest bang for the buck for the least amount of work. I want to keep it simple and subtle. Um, so window light is my personal preference, even though I do have lots of lighting and if I need to, I'll bring it. But I prefer to, to find an environment that naturally exists that I can use um, because it means I can get in get this, that segment shot and then move on to something different so that my client is able to have a lot of variety. I do a lot of variety because I want them to, to purchase albums of pictures, not just a single image. I don't want to have a shrine on the wall. I want to have books with um, collections of images that are catalogs of their children's life year to year. Um, I really believe in the power of albums. In fact, to this day, for my grand, two granddaughters, I do uh, the first year, I do uh, usually, um, I do a session every quarter for them. Um, and I do an album every single year for the kids um, of each of them so that as they grow up, they are able to, to see, you know, how they grew up. And it's so cute because my oldest granddaughter is six years old. Um, she'll be actually six in two days. And she, every time she comes to my home, she wants to look at those albums in her own home, when I go to her house and she's visiting with her friends, one of those things that she always does is she pulls the books out and she says, I want to show you when I was born. And she starts telling them the story of her birth and such. Um, thank you. This was yeah. also done in my, in my home, or not my home, in the client's home. And I wanted to showcase this particular picture because I wanted you to see that Sometimes you just got to let them go. <laughs> um, and each family is different. For instance, this family is very structured. They like photographs that are a bit more formal. They, they're okay being directed. Well, this little kid, she is one of my very favorite clients I've ever photographed. Photographed her parents' wedding, um, have photographed her and her little sister for, since the day they were born. And they're very loosey-goosey. They're the kind of kids who don't want to sit still, will not stand still and let me pose them. So I have to work with them on their terms. And so those terms are, let's let them play. And so I really believe in letting children be who they are. So I have to find a way to fit what I want from them to be in keeping with who they are. In fact, my oldest granddaughter is exactly that way. She's that kid who does not like to have her picture taken. If I point a camera in her face, this child is going to look down for sure. She is not going to have any part of me photographing her. So I have to really um, think outside the box when it comes to capturing them. But what's wonderful about that is that you get who they are. And when their parents see those images, they go, hey, you caught her smile. That's who my daughter is. Um, that's not limited to just little kids. Sometimes you need to have um, that moment, even when you're photographing adults, let them run around and play. And if I, I find if I have somebody who's super static and super nervous, if I just get them to walk it off or run it off, so to speak, um, then I'm gonna get a much more relaxed experience from that subject. One of the things that's to me so important is that we understand direction of light and that we understand the quality of light and learn to look for opportunities to capture naturally. Um, this is a photograph of, um, of uh, my granddaughter's first ballet recital. Um, she's the little girl on the left-hand side and her best friend, Addie, is on the right-hand side with the, the ballerina, the teacher. Now, the reason I, um, I, I brought this slide in here is I want to show you what you can do in just capturing Natural, natural moments, um, pay close attention to body language. Um, with those two little kids, I had literally about a whisper of a moment. I'm sitting in the audience with the rest of the moms and dads. Um, I couldn't be the obnoxious grandma with a good camera, you know, out there just, you know, trying to get out of my way and so forth. I, I don't, I have found that it's not necessary for me to be 
pushy, as long as I understand where the direction of light is and then move myself into position to capture a meaningful image, my camera's always up to my eye when I do that, I can capture something meaningful. And it's amazing that sometimes the best images are captured, are, are images that I really didn't intend, I didn't think they were gonna happen, and they were better than what I initially planned out in my mind, if you get my drift. John, how am I doing? Do you have any questions for me? Uh, you're doing great, but if people in the audience, if you have questions, you can pop into the chat or unmute and join in. Okay, so um, one of the other things that I try to do is, especially is in, is in getting people engaged with one another. Um, this is also a portrait of my little granddaughter with my son, Cameron. Both of them hate having their picture taken. So I kept trying to think, well, how can I incorporate both of them in a picture without making it be a high mom? Because they wouldn't stand for that. They weren't going to, they're not going to be part of that. So by having them engage with one another, all I needed to do was to put him in a spot where the window light could come in and, and cross his body on the, on the backside, illuminating the subject, which is her, my little granddaughter, um, and then create triangular shapes. If you notice, there's a triangular shape from my son Cameron down to my granddaughter JD and up to the mannequin and then down to the books and the little teddy bear on the right hand side. So I try to make pleasing composition as well. One of the other things that I believe in working with is reflective surfaces. Um, so this was just shot outside of a, uh, of a storefront um, in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I loved this particular spot. It's just, I just leaned her against the wall and was able to um, skim my camera along that window um, to capture a double exposure of the two of them. Now, the thing I want you to, to notice is look at the subject. They're not a traditional high mom couple. And I think that that's so important that we embrace who the client is. Um, her body art, look at the way he is dressed, um, the, the cool way he's dressed and so forth. Um, notice the way he's leaning into her. And this is the exact wording that I use. First thing I did is I said to the young lady, I said, with your shoulder, I want you to lean back into the wall. Because I find that if you become very body part specific, with your subjects that you can get them to do exactly what you want them to do right away without any problems whatsoever. So I'm telling her, say with your shoulder, lean back. And then with your tummy, I want you to press your tummy forward just a little bit so that it creates this really pretty um, 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 inverted C curve on her. With the gentleman, I said with your chest and your chin, I want you to lean into her slightly, which gives that image it's a bit of believability. Now notice what's going on that's a little different, same couple. He's actually rocking forward onto his forward leg on the right leg. So I want you to separate your feet a little bit and I want you to rock forward with your, uh, with your chest. And then I want you to hug her head with your cheek. So becoming a bit more body part specific with the subjects. Um, again, as I mentioned, sometimes you have clients that want, um, that you need to become a bit, uh, less structured with when you're working with them. So with this young couple, this is a, an image I did in Palm Springs, and it was 108 degrees that evening that we did this session. Absolutely, I think the hottest location I've ever photographed in in my entire life. And because of that, it was really important to, um, to give them quick breaks. So what I did is I said, hey kids, I just want you to go for a little walk. I'm standing probably, um, uh, about 100 feet, 100 yards or something, you know, pretty good distance from them using a long lens, uh, and then just capture them along the scene um, as they were walking along. My goal is to create a variety of images so that they have some that can go on a wall, like this could easily go on a wall without being like, hey, that's a big picture of your face sitting on the wall. When it comes to capturing images of couples that are in love, I try to use words that convey that loving feeling. Once I have my environment picked out, um, I always, to me, the light is the most important thing. Where is the main light coming from? Um, and in this case, it's coming from the upper left-hand side. Um, with this young couple, I just told her, I said, I want him to pick you up. And when, you, when he picks you up, I want you to hug him like it's the last time you're going to hug. 
learned that from Dennis, uh, from uh, Jerry Guionis uh, many years ago. It's a really, it's amazing what happens when you tell somebody not just to hug, but to hug like it's the last time you're ever going to do so. It really does change the way that people do things. So now let's talk about some tools and props um, that you can use to create an interesting photograph or to, to create interesting stories. So some of the things I use are books, fabric, plastic wrap, bubbles, stapler tape, window screen, newspaper, and also one of the newest things I use is a bit of wire and I'll show you how I use that. So what am I gonna do with those things? Well, here's one thing that I've done. Um, I, I bought just some simple old books. I went to the to just like an antique store and bought some books that I liked the color, the colors that were in those books. Um, I, I collect antique trunks in my studio, so I always have at least a couple of those laying around. And in the course of photographing this little girl, I picked up one of those books and just had her hold it up just to create something that was just a little bit um, fun with her, um, you know, so there's simple props. Uh, you notice I don't use tons and tons of props. Well, one of the other things I like working with are feathers. Um, this is my granddaughter, JD. And she, as I said, is probably one of the most difficult people you will ever photograph in your life. She doesn't like to have her picture taken. So as I'm working with her, um, I pretty much keep the camera um, almost just below my chin so that I can look at her in the face as I'm photographing her. I use the Nikon Z7 camera. And one of the things I love about it is you can put that camera on completely silent mode. I love that feature. It is such a great tool when you're working with somebody who doesn't like to have their picture taken like my granddaughter, JD. So I put this little, um, this little feather thing on her head and just started ch chatting with her. And I could just click away without her ever even knowing that she's getting her picture taken. How about some plastic, some um, plastic you can use from um, like a wrapping paper. Um, I, and I try to give myself a personal assignment um, about every, oh, every eight weeks to three months or so. And I do it because it's a way for me to try in a very relaxed way. It's a great way for me to try something different, to just try something to just to play without any pressure. So if you ever want to try something new or you're working out some new techniques, you know, get a model, get somebody to come into your studio, play with them so you can work out the kinks, not on your client's dime, but on your own dime. And that way you get to really, to, to just practice some technique in, in the privacy of your own studio without having any stress or anything like that. And one of the things I, I try to do is if I'm going to have, if I'm working with a subject model like this, um, I'm going to pay them because if I can, I would like to try to pay them um, or at, at, at least give them free images, of course. And that way they, um, they see that there's value to it for them. And all this is is nothing more than just plastic taped around her body um, and then a piece of, of, of ribbon around, around her waist. It's super, super simple. Nothing to it. Yeah, something I've found recently, I've been getting some packages that are getting coming in boxes that are way too big, and they're full of this um, brown craft paper stuffing that has really great lines and patterns in it, and I've been making things out of that for people to kind of interact with in the photos. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Talk about recycling at its best, right? Yeah, they look like backbones almost, the, the way the paper is <laughs> Yes, they do. There. Yesterday, I went to, um, uh, to the dollar store, and I got to tell you, I am crazy about the dollar store. <laughs> and I like it because I can find all kinds of really stupid little things that I might find a way to use. Um, uh, you know, whether it's in front of the camera lens or whether it's something that I can put in my subject's hair or, you know, just, you know, whatever the case is, I find this is a really inexpensive place to go to um, to, to find stupid little little um, things I can use in my studio space. Now with this young lady, all that she has on her body is just a simple piece of fabric. All I've done is taken that fabric and then just uh, use, I use a very simple piece of wire and I literally wire it on her body. Um, she has another piece that's wired from uh, the front of the dress around her neck to hold it up in the front and just one little piece of wire across the back. The great thing about using really thin wire is that you can cut it when you're done, just clip it off and you don't mess up your fabric. You don't, you don't destroy the fabric piece. So I, I prefer to spend a decent amount of money on a good piece of fabric 
um, that I can use many, many different times in many different ways. And then I can um, create something fun for my subjects to, to wear. And it's, um, it's something that you can change your mind. And I like that ability because I get bored super easily. So I can change my mind and, um, and, and create a variety of different looks. Here's a different one that I did. Um, I like fabrics that are stretchy. This is nothing more than a piece of fabric that I've um, wired onto her body. You can see that she has a waistline. All I did was uh, cut two holes. I just took and cut with a scissor um, a hole where each arm would go and then folded the fabric over the top. And um, it was super, super easy. Literally within about a minute and a half, I was finished. And you want to use stretchy material because stretchy material allows you to use, to, to put this on a variety of different body types. You can put it on somebody who's a pregnant girl. You can put it on a, a larger girl or somebody who's small and petite as well. Now in this, what I want you to pay attention to as well is the way that it is lit. Um, just the window light is all I've used to create um, to create separation between her face and the background. Notice the camera's position in relation to the light source. The light is coming from the window and it's just, it's about a 90 degree angle from camera's position. No reflector, just a, a single light source, just to give me a small ribbon of light across the face um, to separate the face and the arm from the background. Notice the right leg's positioning. It's not flat-footed. She's got that knee bent. Now, one of the things I like to do is I take the knees, the knee that is bent, I like to drop it over the other leg so that it is, um, so that it, it creates a nice V point right in that spot. And then in the background, you'll see uh, at the back of the dress, you see how it kind of pulls a little bit. The fabric is tight around her legs. Um, I'll put a piece of wire back there to pull the dress tight across that thigh area to, again, give me a little bit more shape um, for, the, for the gown. Super simple. And, yet, and, and, and again, it, if I make it really fast and simple like this, I, I have more time to spend on um, a surprise, something that's a little bit different. And uh, again, this is about creating an experience. For each client that comes into my studio when I'm doing portraits of women or whatever, I try to do something that is a little bit different to them. Is that window like, diffused I'm or sorry? open? Uh, there's a question in the chat if there was any diffusion over the window. No, oh, it's cool. just a, it's, it's actually, um, it was a, um, um, a south facing window. And it actually was a window that looked out into a courtyard. This, I shot this image at Union Station in St. Louis um, when I was teaching um, for Shutterfest. And so it's just a simple little sliver of light late in the day. And here's how I've learned to identify light sources. Um, no matter where I'm at or what I'm doing, I try to think to myself, well, if I had to photograph right here and now, um, where is my chosen location? Um, so I wanna find a location that is gonna give me a nice, bit of light, um, the light the way I want it to be without the, with that, with this, the least amount of work. So that's kind of my goal. So before I do a session, I might wander around if I'm shooting on location and look for spots that I identify in my mind as being a place that is going to be my spot for photography. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question <laughs> came up is how is the wire secured so it doesn't rip the fabric? Oh, it's super, super simple. Well, first of all, if you're using a stretchy piece of material, stretchy fabric, um, it doesn't rip. I mean, it's, and you want to use thin wire, just a little tiny piece of, I mean, little thin, thin wire. You can get it at a hardware store or Michael's carries it. And you want the thin, you want the, th like on the thinner side of the yeah, wire. Yeah, like thin floral wire. Yeah, ex but no, even thinner than thin floral wire. wire. Um, this is the kind like that they might use for stringing beads or something. Okay. Um, but um, um, you know what? I'll look later on and because I've got a gauge, I've got some of it around here somewhere. I'll look for it and I'll, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you or something. Great. So, <clears throat> and then basically all I do, once I've pulled it across the back, <clears throat> all I do is just take that um, and just twist it together, twist it so that it doesn't come apart. You know, go twist it twice 
and it'll stay put. It really is crazy. You know, if you go to my Instagram page, um, it's Bambi Cantrell uh, on Instagram. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a video that I did um, of a girl wearing a red dress and you can see exactly how I did it. You'll see um, from you'll see the different steps that are involved. I, I'm sure I stuck that on Instagram. Um, so if you check that out, then you can um, you can see how how this is done. But it's super super simple. So here's another one that I've done. Um, this is nothing more than a piece of fabric clamped around her waistline. It's just I use one of those big photo clamps. It's just clamped at her waistline. And she's standing on my camera bag. That's it. She's just standing on my camera bag. So it's super easy. Um, and then the feathers that you see, that's nothing more that felt those um, at a fabric store in San Francisco. You can buy them online, super cheap. And all I did was just tape, uh, or no, not tape. I stapled it to a ribbon so that I could pull it tight across the waistline. So it's just the two ends of the, um, that go from the front to the back on the um on the feathers i just stapled it to a piece of gross grain ribbon and then just tied it around her waist it's just super super easy and um literally anybody could do this i'm not the smartest person that ever lived and i know pretty much if i could do it anybody can um but as you can tell when you look at the subject i want you to pay attention look at her face the style of the garment that you're going to put on that person needs to fit who they are. It needs to fit kind of their persona. Like she's just this, this sophisticated little gal who's just a little bit edgy. Um, she has a, a bit of body art. So it kind of gave me, I knew that she was a little bit on the edgy side. Um, again, I look for the, the visual cues that someone will tell me, give me. Not, not, I don't ask them a bunch of questions. I don't say, you know, what do you want? because people don't tell you what they want. They, um, they'll go, oh, I want this or that, but in reality, they don't really want that. That's just a buzzword they heard. So, so I find that if you really wanna know who somebody is on the inside, just look at what they're wearing, and that tells you a lot. Do they, um, like for women especially, um, does she have a manicure? Is she into, um, do her, does her handbag match her shoes? Um, things like that, is she all coordinated? Those tell me whether she's into details or not. Um, does she have just, is she the gal who doesn't really fuss over herself too much? Um, you know, is she wearing tons of makeup or is she, you know, somebody who's just a bit more of a minimalist? And that tells me a lot. This is one of my very favorite pieces of fabric to work with, and it's not even fabric. What this is, is window screen. Yes, the kind of window screen that you probably have in your windows at home. It's nothing more than aluminum. I prefer the lightweight aluminum window screen. And what is wonderful about it is you see how it looks just kind of like, like this subtle powder blue color. It's really so pretty. And all I've done to achieve those, those uh, folds in it, um, or not folds, but those, those, that bubbling effect, is I've used little pieces of wire and underneath and pulled the fabric um, or the, the window screen together in certain places and, and then wired it off. And if you wanna see an example of this, again, if you go to my Instagram page and scroll back, uh, you'll see, um, I've got a short video on there on how I actually create um, this kind of, um, of garment. I put and the Instagram in the fun. chat. What was that? I put your Instagram link in the chat for people. Oh, great, along. good. So um, and now for modesty, um, I gave, I put on a little, I've got these really cheap little slips that I, I buy. They're floor length and they're just really close to the body. I, I usually buy a size medium because a lot of different size girls can wear them and they're body hugging, you know, under you know, a garment that just covers the body and that way, you know, it's not something that's going to, I'm not going to, you know, show the world her goods or anything. Yeah. Is models. she moving here or stationary? No, she's actually moving. Um, and, but it looks she's she's moving but she's not moving fast that's not why you're seeing that movement you're seeing that movement because that's the way that i bent the material bent the wire to even give it more of an illusion of of movement she's just basically moved her foot um to the um to the left she just took her her right her left leg and moved it to the left and that gives her this beautiful bit of movement 
Sometimes it means that you're going to, you want to create that bit when we're talking about movement. Um, I, I try to get my subjects to flick. Um, I get her to flick the garment with her fingers. You can kind of see where she's done that with her fingers. I'm going to have them flick the fabric with the, um, the middle index finger and the thumb, not the first finger, but that middle finger, and just having them flick it a little bit. And when you do that, I just try to rotate the shoulders a little bit so that it gives a bit more attitude. Um, I always try to turn the face or the sh shoulder a little bit back towards the daylight or towards the window light a little bit, because I like to play towards the light source. So let's refine that posing just a little bit more. Um, you don't necessarily have to see sharp the body to be able to pose properly. Um, this is an image that I captured in real time. Um, uh, I have a piece of plexiglass in my studio and this young woman is basically standing right behind the plexiglass. It's 25%, um, um, it's, um, um, it's got an opacity of 25%, so it's quite, it's quite opaque. And what really becomes important when you're, when you're doing this kind of image, um, I could have done this in Photoshop, but I, I really like doing it in the camera. Um, it's important to keep the arms away from the body. You see, keeping those arms away from the body, you still get to see a little bit more of her shape. You can actually see where her little butt cheek is kind of pressed up against that white uh, plexiglass. And then one leg is, um, she scissored her ankles a bit and turned the face towards, um, towards the left just slightly. Um, I really like doing this kind of thing. I like doing it in the camera. Um, this particular client ended up with a 40 by 60 uh, enlargement in their home. In fact, because of the way that I shot this, um, this could be, become the kind of image that uh, you could sell as a fine art piece and not have to worry about, you know, oh, you know, this is so subject, um, um, everybody knows who this subject is. In other words, it just becomes more of a fine art piece. Um, in addition to capturing it behind this, I did add a bit of texture to the, um, um, to the image in post um, because I really wanted to pull up some blue tones um, on that right side. I just felt that it was very harmonious to what was going on on the left. Here's another example of that. This is exactly that same opaque window. Um, and Notice the positioning of the legs. See how that back arm and that, that, that knee being bent, one knee is bent at all times. Um, scissoring that ankle, uh, the legs is really important because I need to see that there's separation between those two feet. Keeping that one arm, the left arm, away from the body slightly really helps me to be able to create um, uh, the semblance of a waistline which gives my subject a bit more curve and grace. It's really, really, it's just gives it a really nice look. Um, this is that same dress you saw earlier, the girl that was standing by this, this window. One of the things, I, and I pulled this up because I wanted you to see two things. I wanted you to see you, see, you can see her arms, you can see where I just cut the fabric. I just cut it with a pair of scissors. So it's not fancy, it's not done, I've not, um, you know, sewed it or anything. Literally, all I did was just put a hole in it. But that's why you want to use a stretchy jersey, like a fabric that's stretchy, because then it doesn't, um, um, it, <coughs> it pretty much stays put where it needs to go. And it's something that um, isn't going to tear. You don't, it's really, you, you can't tear it very easily. And then all I did was I put that little piece of wire at the back and then just hung them a decorative pin on the back of her, her dress to give it, um, to make the back of the dress look as pretty as the front of the dress. So much fun. I can't even tell you, I just have a ball doing it. And this is a very similar concept, very similar. All this is, is just that same style of material, but, um, and the, with the cutout in the arms, but all I did was pull up the material up her neckline. This is actually shot in the same, in the same hotel as well. So let's talk about how to create shape um, with the body and why it's so important um, in relation to the light source. Um, I have a window that's on the, this is actually taken in my studio where we had that pink chair that you saw earlier. That's exactly where I shot this. And 
Um, so the lighting is a 90 degree angle to the camera's position. Now, why did I choose to do that? Well, look at the muscles on this woman's back. I really wanted to showcase her beautiful back. She had, um, with this particular gown, this dress was all about the back of that dress. The front was very, meh. It was, it was not a bad looking dress, but that wasn't what it was all about. All of why somebody would purchase this gown would be because of the back. And so by positioning her in this, this specific location with the light skimming across her back like that, then I'm really going to see those, um, the, the muscle in her back and showcase her back in a really elegant way. <clears throat> Notice also the way that the arms are positioned. I'm photographing into the more of the shadow area of the arms, which means it keeps the arms from looking uh, very large and bulky. Um, let's talk a minute about the hips. The, um, the, um, the right knee is bent. And what happens when you do that, when you bend one knee, you take and break, it, it forces the weight to go, um, to go to the other side. And so I really want to be able to have that bit of an S curve, that pretty shapely curve. So almost always I'm gonna bend a knee. Um, and I can tell photographs where somebody, even if I don't see their feet, I can tell an image where the client or the person, uh, photographer has not, um, bent one knee on a subject if they're having them stand flat footed because it really creates such a static image. When it comes to lighting, I think you can really do so much by um, that little test I showed you or I told you about earlier, where you walk around a home and you say, okay, from this side to that side, where is my chosen location? So when I walk into an environment, like I did in this particular case, my assistant is with me and I'm going, okay, I want you to stand over here. Let me see what the light looks like on you so that when my, my bride and my groom walk in that room, if I'm gonna photograph them, I know exactly where I'm gonna place them ahead of time so that there's no surprises. I don't wanna drag my subjects all over the place and go, okay, stand here. No, I don't like that. Okay, let's go over here. No, I don't like that. So if you have another body with you, an assistant with you, you can start laying out in your mind where your spots are gonna be, where your chosen location is gonna be, so that you can go boom, 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 and get a, a quality session done of your bride and groom in real time um, in the environment, you know, in, in a specific environment without a lot of work. So here's another one. This is the same in location. And so I had my assistant stand over where the groom, this young man was gonna stand. And that way I could see kind of where I wanted to be ahead of time. Um, that uh, angle of lighting on your subject is really critical for giving the body shape. This was actually captured in my studio. I shot this for today's Bride Magazine. And what I want you to notice is the way that the light is skimming across that dress. Um, one of the biggest problems I find quite often when uh, people are photographing uh, brides is that they, um, they flat light them too much so that you don't see the detail on the dress. And more importantly, you don't see the shape of the subject. So if you look at the way that I've captured camera position it is between 45 and 75 degrees from the camera's position. So lighting is about mm, 45 to 90 in that realm. Um, so the light is skimming across her body, which shows up her beautiful bone structure and also gives her cleavage. It actually gives, shows her body shape and gives her more shape. Again, bending a knee is really important. I just basically say, I want you to kick out your leg a little bit uh, because what happens when she does that is it'll give me, you see the little uh, hip action going on on that left-hand side, camera left. Um, you can see that it's given her body a little bit of shape there. Everything you've seen thus far has been with just window light. And that's pretty much what I try to do is work in, in, in with the window light. But what I try to pay attention to is I'm going for, I'm looking for highlights and shadows and highlights and shadows, highlights and shadows. So even when I'm photographing the groom, like in this case with this young man, um, you'll notice that there's a subtle highlight on the back of the couch or on that piece of furniture that he's sitting on that creates separation between the subject 
and the background. And that's important to me in creating dimensional images, images that have a bit of, have a bit of dimensionality. Chiaroscuro. Huh? Chiaroscuro, the, the light right. to dark to light to dark. And the, yes. contrapo and the contrapostal poses that you do. Right. So now I see we're starting to, um, I know this, it's like 10 after 11 and I don't want to <laughs> overstay my welcome. Um, do we have any last minute questions that I can answer before I, um, before I sign off or I, I want to make sure I give you your money's worth. <laughs> Anyone you can unmute and say hi and join in. Uh, if no one else is going, I, sometimes I'm wondering how you are managing shadows when you're working so much just with natural light. Are, are, are there reflectors? I mean, you showed early on. Uh, you saw <coughs> but I was just impressed with how uh, subtly the shadows were also managed. I'm just wondering if you have any comments on that. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I really do. I like working with a reflector. And I tell you what, I'm, 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 I'm proficient with studio lighting as well. Um, but I really, one of the things I like about working with a reflector is that I can, I can see the area that I want to kind of like highlight a little bit, that I want to just give a little kick or two. Like for instance, in this area, this image with this young man. So before he even sits down, I'm paying attention. I've really trained myself to see highlights and shadows and the way the light falls across the room. So what I would recommend doing is if you're at lunch, if you're sitting in a restaurant in the evening, or if you're sitting at home, um, watch the way the light, any light, it can be a light bulb, it can be, you know, your overhead ceiling light, whatever. Notice the way the light falls on things in your room, and it starts helping you to start seeing dimensionality. In, in, you know, that's what gives your image dimensionality. I also like to watch movies, especially old movies, because... The, the way that they lit, I, I think they just light masterfully. I just love the way that they can create mood by um, the way that they light something. So um, that's what I would do. The other thing that I will tell you that I do that I think is also important is in Lightroom, when I'm working with my adjustments, when I, um, I pull my raw images in, I do shoot raw and I will um, adjust the file I'll pull down the highlights sometimes and then bring back the shadows just a little tiny bit. So if I see um, an area that I want to be able to, to see those shadow areas a little bit more, I can pull them back and post if I, um, if I need to. But I will tell you, by and large, I'm, I'm really that gal that um, likes to get it right in the camera. Um, I like to um, um, really try to get as much done and that comes from being an old school photographer I mean when I was you know photographing when I started in photography 30 years ago I, I really try to pay attention and to what's going on visually like for instance in the room that I'm in right now um, this is not a very pretty room for photographing but still there's there's things about that that we can learn from like for instance um, like you see there's two bright windows behind me well that would not be ideal if you just shut your eyes a little bit and you squint, that's all you're gonna see. So what could you do in this kind of a scenario to possibly minimize that, um, uh, um, that brightness to make it so that it doesn't just like completely, let's say that this is where you had to photograph. Well, there's a couple of things we could do. Number one, change your camera angle. Get up on a chair or something, a ladder, and that minimizes some of that background Absolutely. Um, and so that's one of the things I'll do. So I, I kind of play a game with myself. I, I do this all the time. I'll say, well, if I had to photograph in this room right here and now, where's my chosen location? And how can I minimize and make something good out of something trashy? <laughs> and so that's one of the things I do. If you look at right here on my chair, see how it's got a little highlight right there? So um, that can kind of help me if I'm Photographing from a higher camera angle, I can still get a little bit of a, 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 a um, um, some separation between myself and the background. Um, higher camera angle, by the way, on a mature woman is like the way to go. Um, higher, a, a light source that's a little bit higher is also good for underneath here. If you look, I've got a bit of a shadow underneath my chin, which is much more flattering than flat than lighting 
uh, from underneath or maybe straight in. <clears throat> the size of a light source makes a big difference as well. And so there's a variety of different um, things that if you just learn to identify where the main light is coming from and how you use that to create a pretty image, you can work with a wall and a window um, or a curtain and um, or even a carpet. This is just nothing more than a carpet hanging over my banister. So like if I turn my body this way, I have a window that I've opened, a curtain that I've opened right in front of my, uh, right behind my screen, just because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see my face. But hang on, I want to show you what happens when I close it. Hang on a sec. <clears throat> okay, so now the main light, where's the main light coming from? Probably here, correct? So if I, now I could actually go and skim, I could, higher camera angle could be really pretty. If I move my camera position from here to over this way, I could still get a really pretty image. Um, or you could use a reflector if you wanted to, but I personally prefer, um, I like um, to have the main light, I would want it to be a larger um, light source than, than what I would get from a reflector. Cool. So. Uh Celeste is asking if there's any favorite old movies that you like for the highlights and shadows. Oh gosh, there's so many. <laughs> um, anything Alfred Hitchcock made, but old movies, I love the old movies that Alfred Hitchcock made. I just saw a movie the other day, and I want to say, it, what was the name of that movie? Ugh. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but uh, I mean, uh, I like, I really do like the forties movies of the forties were just amazing. Also my, uh, one of the books that inspired me greatly was um, George Harrell's Hollywood. It's called Har uh, Harrell's Hollywood. That was, that was by far the number one book that in my early days in photography in the professional arena, that was such an eye opener for me. And technically um, George Harrell didn't like, very well. I mean, he had to paint the catch lights in their eyes and through the whole book, you see all the painted catch lights. It's really funny. But what I liked about it was that you could create such mood with the way the dramatic lighting, it wasn't perfect lighting, but it was dramatic. And I, I always have a saying about that uh, expression beats perfection. Well, when it comes to lighting, if you have drama to me, a dramatic image. If you've got to make a mistake, make a mistake on drama. In other words, if you have to err, you want it to be dramatic. Um, like the picture I showed you of the girl that's all blurry, that could be, um, that could be either a mistake or it could be done on, intentionally done on purpose to create something unique. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep. So, you know, I guess the whole idea is I try to create images that have an element of surprise to them. I want some of those images to be, um, you know, one plus one equals two. In other words, um, what you see is what you get, you know, very normal pictures that are just really pretty and so forth. But then I want some that are controversial, not vulgar controversial, but they're like, what is that? Something that's just a little bit different. And that way um, it, it, it evokes an emotional response. It doesn't have to be a good response. It just has to be an emotional response. Um, because if it's an emotional response, that's a good thing. It always is a good thing because people will talk about it. If you ever have a chance to, uh, to um, sit in on print competition, I'm a judge and I've been a chair of print competition for WPPI for many years um, and also for Shutterfest as well. And hands down, the images that um, are boring, that have that are just like, that they may technically be a good image, but if they're boring, they're screwed. It's going to get a 65. The ones that they have to talk about, even if they are technically not good, but they're really weird and wacky and you go, why, what the heck's that? You know, it, it, it invokes a conversation and that's a very good thing. So um, I always say, you know, if you're going to err, err on the side of doing something that's a little bit, um, that's surprising. So that's what I try yes. to do these days. Cool. Well, thank you. This has been great. I mean, a lot of great information here. I really appreciate you coming on today. Well, I'm, I really appreciate you inviting me, John, and I really care about our photo industry. 
And if there's one thing I could say to you guys, um, I would say um, it's hard not to get discouraged when right now people are trying to just put food on their table. And for those of you that are, um, you know, that are concerned about that, even if you have to get a day job, that doesn't mean you quit doing photography. What, what something, I, I always say you got to keep your mind open to what you need to do to be able to accomplish your goals. And when I started in photography 30 years ago, um, I worked out of my home. Um, I had, I lived in a very poor neighborhood, but I made sure my house was the nicest house on the neighborhood. In other words, not that it was fancy. I lived in a very blue collar neighborhood in, um, in, 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 I was like three blocks from an oil refinery. So which tells you a lot if you saw that. <laughs> in fact, somewhere there's a video with that on there. I just, I can't remember if it's a creative live video or what, but I might even have it here somewhere. But what's, what's about that is I always just made sure that when somebody came to my home for their viewing, that they forgot everything they saw outside. So if it, I made sure that, you know, cause I had um, my son growing up and my husband, I made sure that they were off doing men things. I should have remembered that today and sent my husband off to go do men things. Well, he was. He's working out on the farm. Yeah, he's he's doing men things out here, and you know, I should have sent him to chase the chickens. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, there's always a way to accomplish what you want to do. Maybe it's not the way that you initially thought you would do it, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that you have to change. And you have to be willing to be adaptable and say, okay, well, what can I do with what I've got? And maybe it means you have to take baby steps, but there's always a way to accomplish what you want to do. You just have to, to um, maybe it's not the original way that you were wanting to do it. The cool thing about that is if you really approach that in a positive way, you might find that your new way of, 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 of handling a situation or doing something is way better than what you originally had planned in your mind. I know that happens to me so many times. I'm always going to plan B in my mind. And plan B always is better than plan A ever was. Yeah, I think last week I said to someone, you know, the less you plan, the less can go wrong. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> to this day in my studio, my um, um, sometimes people say, well, baby, do, do you plan out your sessions? No, not at all. The only thing I plan is the amount of time that I will spend in that specific session but I never have an agenda and I don't on purpose because I find that it's, it puts me in here it's and it loses, I lose my creativity. So if I have a, a, a loose outline of kind of where I want to go, then I've, I've allowed myself time to be, to be a free bird and to say, if something amazing is happening to be able to explore that path a little bit more. And I think that's especially important if you're photographing children, um, is that you really have to be flexible um, and, you know, kind of go with the flow and, and, you know, be on their terms, not try to make them be on your terms. Great. That actually works for brides too, by the way. <laughs> Very cool. Any last minutes from anyone else here? So let's see, coming up in the next couple of days or weeks, I've got uh, Johnny Edward, uh, Lisa Carney, and Kim Weston and Judy Host coming on. So check out my schedule for the conversations. And I hope you can join us again. And thank you so much, Bambi. This has been really great. Thank you. It was a delight seeing all of you. By the way, I do answer all my own email. And uh, my email address is Bambi, B-A-M-B-I, at CantrellPortrait.com. I'm on Instagram, Bambi Cantrell, and also on fa uh, Facebook as well. And um, uh, I'm an ambassador for Nikon, and um, I'm grateful to have had time with you all this morning, and I wish you all the best. Have great. a great day. And one last question. Celeste was asking the name of the book again. I think that was the Harrell Hollywood Portraits. Hollywood. Yeah. Harrell's Hollywood Portraits. Yeah, cool. it's really good. Worth the investment. You guys have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye.